Okay, so now looking under the car, there's quite a lot of differences between this Lotus Carlton and our road going version. And a lot of this work you've carried out, this is all bespoke stuff specific to this car. When we built the car, yes, we, the main criteria was building it to, uh, to cool it in the desert to make sure there was not going to be any cooling problems. Um, we knew we were going to be travelling at speed, but the ambient temperature is obviously very high and there's very little humidity, so um, uh, very dry. You've got, you've got a couple of great big braided hoses that are different into the oil coolers at the front. The oil coolers are Cetra oil coolers, similar to the ones on the original car. The original car, they, they run them at a 45 degree angle um, and they, the pipes go in at the top and then come out at the top. But these ones, they cross flow so that they actually go in at one corner and come out the opposite corner, which is thought to be slightly more efficient. So hence the, the display braided hoses on there. Um, See. We've got a big bit on the sump there as well, like a big feed, is that a return feed? There's a return feed, yeah, yeah. This um, bit here, that one's a huge... That's standard Lotus that's Carlton standard. part, yeah. Because the front cover is quite different on a Lotus Carlton, because there's no distributor drive, they use a distributor drive for an additional water pump um, to charge the wheel. And then uh, and the, the return feed for the turbos goes into the sump on this side. And you see the turbo returns. Oh, yeah. That's all standard Lotus Carlton. So the engine's pretty standard. Um, internally, it, it was all standard, just blueprinted. Uh, and then the, the biggest difference was probably lightweight flywheel and clutch. We knew that the standard clutch, and particularly the pivot pin and um, fork arrangement, because it's a pull type clutch on a Lotus, so you're pulling the diaphragm, and there's a fork which pivots on the bell housing about here. And, uh, and that pivot pin and the bell housing is a weak point. The pivot pins break, the forks break. They went through various, Lotus went through various iterations, but it, it's always been a weak link and when it fails, it's just stranded at the side of the road. So we put a, a lightweight flywheel um, to get rid of the dual mass flywheel, which was a monstrous thing. And, uh, and then a triple plate, seven and a quarter inch clutch with um, a pushed uh, centrifugal um, uh, concentric uh, clutch release bearing, I should say. So uh, it pushes off the front of the gearbox to release the clutch. So instead of having any kind of fork or pivot pin, that's a whole a completely hydraulic arrangement. You can see the hydraulic pipes here. And oh, actually yeah. put a drive, a drive brake connector in there, which is hugely expensive. I seem to remember for walking a tiny little part, but it makes bleeding the clutch a lot easier. And again, another weak point of the Lotus is that they've got a, a very, on the, especially the right-hand drive cars, they've got a very small um, clutch master cylinder, uh, and as such, it doesn't move very much fluid, and so getting the air out of it, because the pipe goes up over the back of the engine and then comes down this side of, to the to the actuator. Um, and left-hand drive cars got a different a different um, pedal box, and a much longer master cylinder, which makes it a lot easier. But the right-hand drive cars, they can be a, a nightmare to bleed. So we thought, well, if we have to take the gearbox out at any time, then it makes it a lot easier if you can just keep the, um, the hydraulic system intact without having to re-bleed it again, which can take hours, if not days. I believe the gearbox is it's a six-speed, is that a ZF that was originally in a Corvette? That's that right, it it's the, 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 the um, ZF six-speed, which was in a Corvette, and they also, Aston Martin used it on a couple of their cars, the big super twin supercharged V8, Aston used the same gearbox. So plenty strong enough for the torque of these engines. Um, the other limiting factor with the clutch was, was also the bell housing is actually quite small. The Corvette has a much bigger V engine, has a much bigger bell housing, so they've got a much bigger diameter clutch. The Lotus had a, a quite small diameter clutch as standard, um, and because of the, the limitation of the bell housing, principally because the car was never designed for a V engine, so the chassis rails are quite close. The, the limitation in the, the transmission tunnel is quite tight. So um, the, the clutch is, tends to be a weak link on a Lotus Carlton. So we wanted to just try and engineer some of those weak points out so that we weren't stranded in the desert somewhere with something that we knew could, uh, could fail. Awesome, we'll stop that clutch there. That's ideal. Well, we're going to talk about the suspension because obviously that's. You've got your adjustable toy, the bespoke 
Tour adjusters on it. Yeah. They've done it's got its own springs and shock absorbers as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, because they've got is it like poly booster and not that, I think. Uh it's not actually. No, no, we kept mm-hmm. that all fairly compliant. Um if you go too far there, you'll have no given at all. Obviously. Yeah. Well I think the other big thing for high speeds is uh, which probably is a positive from the Lotus point of view because they have the steering box instead of a steering rack. But actually at high speeds that tends to sort of self-centre itself as the car's relatively mm-hmm. stable anyway. And so you haven't you haven't got any kind of mm-hmm. micro adjustment going on because the steering by design is quite vague. Yeah, um, we'll do that because it's got split it's got uprooted springs and shocks on it. The standard Lotus Carlton has air suspension at the back ah. uh, for self-leveling. Um, the main reason they put air suspension on the back was to keep the, the rear camber um, within very... Oh, if you go and chuck a luggage and a lot of people in the back. Well, you've just done a bank job. Yeah, you've got, well. you've got these huge wide tires at the back. That's a good point, um, To keep them upright, to we'll maintain top. traction, they, they put yeah. self-leveling on. Are they, they're they're standard. Have. Yeah, they're standard. Oh, yeah. Right. That's more like mm-hmm. the normal tow adjusters mm-hmm. on the front with those sort of... Cl- Clamps. Yeah, that's gonna. And they always seize up. Oh, and don't they just die? Yeah, they can't help me up. What not? That's all. Yeah. And so looking at the suspension in the car, it's got quite a few updates to it, but perhaps not as many as you might expect. Um, we've got some bespoke tow adjusters there, and they were made by yourself. They are a BTB. Item. Correct, yeah. We, we developed those principally to make adjusting the tracking a lot easier um, because the original system has uh, the pinch bolts to a split tube um, and they inherently they just rust up the, the, the salt and everything gets into them and you just can't adjust them very easily. So when we're changing suspension settings from like track settings to the high speed settings that we had um, in the desert, and we have to change the ride height or different springs and that kind of thing. The, the, the toe adjusts quite a lot with ride height, so readjusting that is actually makes it a lot easier. Um, and then these are stainless steel, so we know they're never going to actually rust up, and we can always adjust them whenever we need to. But what um, springs and shocks is on it? So at the moment, the um, the reason it was quite skittish on the road uh, is <laughs> because they've got it's got a track day set up, so the springs are probably 50% stiffer than your standard road spring. Um, when we ran it in the desert, it was a much uh, softer front spring, which actually also ran the car a lot lower um, to the benefit of aerodynamics. But when I spoke to the engineers at Lotus and they set the uh, homologated top speed for the car at Nardo, um, it was actually 177, 176 but on the bowl it wasn't actually as fast as they found it was on the autostrada going down in Italy um, when they had three people and all the luggage in the car because of the self-leveling on the, the back of the Lotus the front was actually a lot lower and they found that they were getting a lot higher top speed on, apart from the fact that it wasn't actually on a bowl it was on a straight line but the fact that the nose of the car was lower so they, they recommended running the car as low at the front so, as possible. So where were they testing it? Were they testing it on like public roads? They, they drove, the, the original prototypes, they drove down to Nardo in southern Italy and they've got like a massive speed bowl there which they set the top speed runs on. But there's always some tyre scrub um, there as well which reduces the speed of it. Now, the Lotus had, originally they've got air suspension in the rear of them. Correct, yeah. So. Normally, however much load you put in the car, the rear suspension always stays at the same height because there's airbags on the suspension and a sensor on the rear, um, which you can see normally picks up off here. There's a little uh, tie rod oh, yeah. and a little, um, it's a little sensor arm. Socket there for that. Yeah, yeah um, and we we did uh, we did think about running that for uh, America because of the the weight of the fuel. Um, obviously the. The, the weight in the car varies from the start of the run to the end because you're using probably nearly 90 litres of fuel. So, um, but it, it 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 was a bit too complicated for us to work that out, and also we had um, a little bit more control over the dampening because we've got adjustable dampers on there, which originally built by Leader and since serviced by Gaz. Um, so, we settled for a sort of intermediate ride height knowing that it was perhaps a little bit lower at the start of the race but the difference wasn't significant 
the other reason that Lotus had the self-leveling to keep that, that rear tyre upright was because of the sheer width of them. When Once it actually starts to sink, you get a lot of camber gain and a lot of negative camber and you end up running with only the inside edge of the tyre, which overheats quite quickly um, with a lot of load and a lot of high speeds. Well, we're so, doing like that, the speeds don't be going in this, yeah. Yeah. So um, the other significant thing at the back is the diff cooler that we added to the differential. Oh, yes. That's great. The, yeah, the, um, again, the Lotus engineers said, how long is the race you're doing? Uh, and I said, 90 miles. And they said, well, you're going to need a bigger fuel tank, which we'd already worked out. And they said, if, you need, if you're putting a bigger fuel tank in, you're going to need to run a diff cooler because they'd established that the diffs overheat at high speed on autobahn runs. But the standard fuel tank capacity um, was used up by the time the diff got to a critical temperature so inevitably you had to stop and fill up with fuel which gives the diff a chance to recover. <laughs> so more fuel capacity meant that the diff was going to get critical and certainly in the first run that was that we did that was an issue. We put the cooler on already but we hadn't quite got the oil fill level right. I see the, the pipes disappear into the boot floor. Yeah well we'd been told by another competitor who had run a Corvette um, and the unlimited class that he'd, he'd had problems with um, a split oil cooler on one of his runs um, because and the only thing because you're running on your own there's no other stones or anything coming up because the, the cars are uh, two minute intervals um, so the only thing you could put it down to is a fly going through the oil cooler but they've got big nasty flies oh they do big the desert, bugs yeah big dry ones and, uh, <laughs> but he was doing 240 at the time so so miles an hour. Miles an hour. <laughs> so we thought, okay, we might not be going that fast, but we didn't really want oil coolers hanging off the back of the car in case we hit anything. Because the, the other thing that there's a problem on that road is is um, uh, roadkill, and um, any things that get run over by trucks and whatever that are still on the road, the turkey buzzers, which are massive, great vulture-like things, oh, okay. come and eat them. So, and their turkey buzzers sort of sit you know, two or three feet off the ground and you see them and you think, oh, it's a crow, but it's twice the size of a crow. And mm -hmm. they don't tend to work out that you're approaching at, at um, three bigger speeds because most cars are doing a maximum of about 55, 65 out in the desert. So <laughs> they tend to have gauged their reaction time according to what the traffic, local traffic's doing. So we were warned about that. And if you hit one, it'd make a hell of a mess of the car. Oh, if you went wow. under the car and mm -hmm. start taking bits off. So we tried to keep it as clean as possible underneath and and because um, the other thing at, at that speed if, if you lose like an oil cooler or something you're not going to know straight away and you might um you can see actually on the, where we've picked up the feed for the oil cooler yeah um is actually above it was well, about the same level as the normal fill level which is on the side of the diff there mm -hmm. so that some people would take it out of the drain hole which is this bolt um but if you did that and there was a problem with the cooler or one of the lines was leaking, effectively your electric pump would, would pump all the oil out of the diff. So we kept it at the fill level and that was when we had an issue um, on the first run because clearly it was just, it was pulling out fresh air. We hadn't quite got the fill level right because of the capacity in the cooler itself and in the pipe work. Um, so on the second run, we just put a, a, a little bit more oil in it and it worked perfectly and the diff never overheated at all. So, um, so that was a bit of development, but you can only you can only try mm. these things by actually doing it. Because uh, there's nowhere to really replicate sustained high no, speeds. Certainly not in the UK. No. In fact, we'd be pushing in Europe actually. <laughs> yeah. And there, it's got this aerodynamic flat floor, which has been added to it as well. What's uh, that been? Have you that been made specifically by yourself? For yeah, the car? we we made it. It's all um, it's plywood with with composite over it, so it's quite strong. It just keeps things from um, damaging the underfloor, but also cleans up the aero underneath. Um, and particularly towards the rear of the car, we added some of these boxes and things here to, to stop the kind of parachute effect of the rear bumper, because normally it's a fuel tank in here, which fills all that space. Well, the fuel tank is now where the rear seats normally go, which you'll see in a minute, um, in front of the axle. And at the back, so there's no fuel tank, so the, um, the bumper acts as a bit of a parachute. So we filled all that in with these boxes and then put the exhaust in the obvious sort of place. Um, and then just to tr try and keep the airflow under the car as clean as possible, um, just to, to, so it's not got too much lift generated under the car.
really viable to have a conversation in it. <laughs> I'll have to wait until we've stopped to do that. <laughs> Was a, obviously, you've paid a lot of attention to the aerodynamics underneath the car here. Uh, now, the Lotus Carlton, as standard, I mean, for its time, was a, a, a car with good aerodynamics. It was quite a, a slippery shape. That's one of the reasons we chose the car for what we planned to do with it. Um, apart from the fact that I was already familiar with Vauxhall products, having raced a Nova myself and, and understood... Um, the, the quality of the engineering, um, which is underrated in my opinion, under that era of car, but we knew that the drag coefficient of a Carlton is actually was was very very effective, um, and the Lotus, as you say, with even with the addition of spoilers and the wider track, um, was still a very slippery shape. So we didn't really want to have to start sort of redeveloping something to to achieve this kind of sustained speed that we wanted for this particular event. And lastly, to cover while we're underneath the car, is of course the exhausts. And with you of being course. BTB exhausts... Well, we use this, this car as a bit of a, a, a sort of test mule, really, for various exhaust ideas. Um, when we ran the car originally in the race, it had some very simple, lightweight, um, straight-through silences, tiny little silences, really. Since then, we've had to go to track days and things where clearly noise is more of an issue. Um, so, and we still use it on the road as well. And one of the issues with Lotus Carlton's is that they, if you, if they don't have catalytic converters in them, and they have a free-flowing exhaust, um, they, the oil seals and the turbo tend to leak. So you get a lot of smoke coming out of the exhaust when you're idling. Um, so we've, um, for two reasons really, we've, we've introduced on this car a, a valved exhaust, which is not. This is quite common these days, but. It's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more unique on this because the valves, instead of being sort of switchable with a vacuum system, were actually boost activated. So when the car's are off boost, the valves are shut, which maintains a certain amount of back pressure in the exhaust, which stops it, stops it smoking, which seems to be working. Um, and then as soon as you get on boost these valves open and the exhaust goes straight through to reduce the back pressure and it's... It so it's an automatic through. switching system with the valves? So, yeah, there's no, there's no solenoids, there's no, um, actually, there's no um, accumulator for vacuum or anything required, it's just plumbed straight into the intake manifold um, and they just open at about 5 psi. So, so is that something that you can offer to Lotus Carlton owners if they wanted to upgrade their exhaust? Yeah, what's, I mean, the, the, what's the options available? We already do a standard Lotus Carlton exhaust, um, and we do uh, cats, which normally fit <laughs> under the front, um, so they're completely interchangeable with the standard Lotus Carlton parts, um, including the, the iconic sort of tailpipe design. Uh, this is a little bit more bespoke. Um, the other thing we've introduced recently, you can see this new yes, part that's here. Yes, this kind of H section here with the... Yeah, that's just, again, to just tune the sound, make it a little bit smoother and, and reduce the um, the uh, the boom slightly, which at low speed, or particularly at, at static noise tests, because a lot of time you go to track days, they test it mm. statically. Most okay. turbo cars uh, are okay because the turbos sort of muffle the sound, but it's usually getting through the static tests is the problem. So that helps with the boom and, and obviously the valves as well. So um, it doesn't cr doesn't create any problems with with sort of track days. That's why we've done some work on this because it's something we know the car's always here and we can get good data off it. So. So now this is the boot inside the race Lotus Carlton, which is very different to the boot that you get inside a normal one, quite obviously. And we can see here that's the fuel filler there, because the regular 70 litre Carlton tank has been dispensed with for a fuel cell. Yeah, you can just about see the fuel cell, there's a bag tank down there. 
It's about... Yeah, it looks like a brown paper bag. Yeah, it's 110 litres, roughly. Um, so that that's fitted uh, to, to fit down into where the rear seats go. Um, you probably see if you open the rear door. Um, and then these pipes here, you, the pipes for the diff cooler, is, that's the diff cooler pump. And then there's some other pipes which come into here, which are actually fuel return cooler. So the, the fuel that goes to the engine when it comes back, because it's been around the engine bay through the rail and everything else is actually hot. And that tends to feed back into the bladder. And we noticed with some race cars that actually the hot fuel going back in um, is actually expanding the bladder. And when it's full, it's getting under quite a lot of pressure. So we put a fuel cooler on the return. And then the return actually feeds into the, the internal swirl pot where the the fuel into the pump is picked up so the the cooler fuel is actually going into the swirl pot so you're getting cooler fuel picked up um, which is slightly more dense so and then this was added um, before the second run that we did which was an extra fan on those two coolers and then a bit of extra ducting around it as well which actually is the the normal through ventilation of a carlton to to get the air flowing through the cockpit in this case we're actually using that to draw air from from here you notice the rubber's missing so just in front of the rear spoiler the back of the windscreen there's air going into the boot and then it naturally wants to find its way out of that hole helped by some slots in the bumper which are all part of that same ducting system so actually um, when that fan comes on you can feel the air blowing out of here and that helped keep the diff cool as well we never had any more overheating problems with the diff mm. What sort of um, range were you getting out that sort well, of amount of fuel? We worked out, I think on the second run, it, it was doing... Oh, Lotus told us that it would do six to the gallon flat out. Um, I think on the second run, we had the wind behind us, it was probably near eight to the gallon. Uh, so um, we didn't think that was too bad, considering the average speed. Mm. So on the inside, you've got your two racing seats and the roll cage. Uh, I think it was the cage built as a one-off for the car. The cage was yeah built. That took the majority of the time. We started with a um, a brand new body shell, not a Lotus one, but it was a standard Carlton body shell. And one of the issues was actually finding a body shell that hadn't got a sunroof hole in, because from about '88 onwards, '89, uh, all of the Carltons, even the 1.8 Ls had sunroofs in, something to do with the fact that they were all company cars and it was a kind of prestigious thing to have and they thought there's no, it was easier to put them in all the cars rather than not have them in. So we had to find a pre-88 uh, roof skin. Um, so scouring um, breakers yards to find a 1.8L pre-88 Carlton, base model <laughs> Carlton, um, that hadn't already had a sunroof hole cut in it and hadn't actually got another car stacked on top of it, which is a big challenge. Um, but we eventually found one, so this has actually got a, a new roof skin. Um, but other than that, the, the shell was a standard, um, brand new shell, so there was no rust or anything like that in it. And then we built the, sh the first thing to go in was the fuel cell actually, and then we built the, the cage sort of around that. Um, uh, and then um, the cage had to uh, be compliant with the, unlimited speed regulations because we wanted to uh, run to start with we we had to run in the 160 class with the carlton um, i'd already been out there and raced a corvette um, in a, a slower speed class because you have to at least have done one event before you're allowed to run at the higher speeds and then ultimately once you've done 160 mile an hour run you're allowed to run in unlimited which is as it sounds it just goes fast as you like um, but in order to run this car in Unlimited, we had to build the cage so that it was suitable for that speed. So it's a two inch main hoop, three mil thick. Um, it's all tied through to all the suspension points as well. So it actually serves a purpose to stiffens the car up. This is the only Carlton I know that you can actually jack it up. And um, if you take one of the axle stands out, it doesn't kind of twist. Um, so generally we have four axle stands as one of them that's not actually connected because the floor is never that flat so we know that the car is really stiff and the cage is strong enough to withstand not just one rollover but multiple rollovers because you're doing that kind of speed it's likely that you're going to roll over more than once 
So fortunately, we never had to test that. Now, inside the race Lotus Carlton, we've got the original Carlton dash pretty much. We've got the original gear stick, clocks, indicator stocks, and that's about it. We've got a lot of other switches and gauges in here. In fact, a whole load of switches are all on buttons here. Was that all uh, kind of put together by yourself to your own specifications? That's right, yeah. Oh, well, this is all circuit breakers instead of fuses. So if something goes, you can actually see straight away what's caused the problem and then potentially you can reset it. If it's still causing a problem, then uh, you know where you're actually looking for, for issues with the fuses once it's gone and you know it's game over. So, and then here um, we've got the diff cooler, which we can switch on. Um, the automatic level system, which we actually disabled in the end, we didn't run with that. We talked about the, the self-leveling rear suspension, that was an optional thing which we never ran. So the diff cooler. Um, on the water temperature gauge here, this is actually a, a three-way uh, three uh, gauge. So when I hold that down, it shows the diff temperature. When I hold that one, it shows the oil temperature on the same gauge. So you're only looking at one gauge, you're not sort of scanning or whatever. But I know when I check the diff temperature, if it gets critical, then the diff cooler goes on and the, the cooler pump in the back is wired to the fan now as well so the, the diff cooler fan comes on and the, and the cooler at the same time. Then the radiator fan we've got just in case uh, we need a bit of extra cooling air for example when we're you know waiting to start the stage or, or something like that or after the event where we need some, uh, some extra cooling so that speaks for itself and then you've got twin fuel pumps um, the main fuel pump is the high pressure pump for the engine and then there's a lift pump because of the shape of the um, fuel cell it actually goes over the transmission tunnel so there's a, one side of it will have fuel in it and there's a lift pump from that side to the other so that you can actually use every drop of, of petrol that's in the tank. None of the heater controls do anything. Um, it gets plenty hot in, uh, enough in here as it is. We've got no air conditioning so it was, uh, it was yes, it was very, very hot, um, the transmission runs through here which gets extremely hot in the exhaust underneath. We, we put a certain amount of lagging under the floor when we built the shell but but there's only so much you can do. And then uh, finally we've got fuel pressure up here, an oil pressure and then an oil pressure light <coughs> just there. Uh, and then fire extinguisher in case the worst happens. Is the fire extinguisher plumbed into the... There's a plumbed in fire extinguisher that sits just behind the passenger seat. Um, and a handheld as well in case there's a problem uh, either with your own car or somebody else's it was mandatory to run both systems so a plumbed in one and a handheld so if you have to put out somebody else's fire. Now this is under the bonnet of the Lotus Carlton. Now this engine is highly advanced anyway as it came from Lotus. They did a lot of work on this uh, engineering it because they started off with a 3 litre 24 valve as a base Correct. And it became a 3.6 twin turbo. Yeah, so it's got a different crank, different pistons, uh, slightly different bore. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's highly modified over a standard one. And one of the, the key issues which they had in the development of it um, was cooling. And so clearly what we intended to do with this car meant that we had to address cooling above all and everything else. So. We, we tried to just just make sure that all the obvious things were were done to make sure it, it was going to cool in the desert. Um, this actually, the, some of these parts are off development cars, hence they're not painted. So the charge cooler and the intake plenum were actually um, salvaged from uh, from some develop, original development cars, and then there's some slight different variations between this and a production one. And it's not running air conditioning as well, which is why there's quite a lot of space on this side of the car, uh, or ABS, but again, just to simplify things, although it makes it a little bit um, scarier on the road, but um, and the, because the brakes are very powerful. Um, but with, yeah, we didn't really need it for as a track thing, so it just sort of keeps it all simple. But it also opens up the area under the bonnet so that there's a bit more air flowing around everywhere to help whatever's coming through the radiator, which we sort of made sure it was all ducted and sealed to the radiator so it can't come anywhere else. It goes through not only the engine ra engine cooler but the charge cooler radiator as well. So this feeds water back through the charge cooler radiator which sits just in front of the main 
uh, coolant rad, and so it has to go both, through both of those. Normally you'd have an air conditioning condenser as well, so you'd have a, a stack of radiators in the front here, but we don't have that, so we've got a little bit more efficient cooling tank. Um, for the second run that we did, we, we actually also um, added a water spray um, that was just taken from the, the washer bottle here and using the high pressure um, electric motor for normally for the high pressure um, headlight washers. We actually just directed that through a little nozzle in front of the radiator. Just because the air is so dry in the desert with just a little bit more moisture going onto the radiator would make it, and, and the charge cooler would make it a bit more efficient. Does it actually uh, run the original Lotus radiator? It does, yeah, yeah, it's completely standard. Right? We didn't have to put a bigger one in. I think it's just all the detail, the ducting, improving that, improving also the other thing that the eagle eyed Vauxhall um, spotters will notice that these are off a, an Astra GSI, um, these little extra ducts out of the side of the bonnet um, just to vacate some of the hot air that builds up at the back edge of the under bonnet area. There's a phenomenal amount of heat comes out these engines, isn't there? Yes. Because you could feel it in the car there, we were out for like a short run in it. And you could already, I mean, it's a cold day today, and you could already feel the heat soaking through the transmission tunnel, and that's at low speeds on a cold day. So I can only imagine what it's like on a hot day when you're running flat out, and the temperatures inside the car must have been unbelievable. Yeah, it was, it was pretty hot, yes. Yeah, you should old, have got a spray bar on yourself. Yeah, <laughs> three triple layer Nomex and, uh, you know, underwear and all that kind of stuff, and a helmet on, it does get pretty hot. So with a 3.6 litre engine it runs two small turbochargers rather than one big one which makes quite a difference in that there's no lag which a lot of turbocharged cars suffered from in the 80s and through into the 90s uh, but the engine is standard internals and standard turbochargers it's basically kind of as Lotus intended Correct, yeah, no, we didn't have to do anything internally, we basically just built it to make sure that every, all the tolerances were as specified and there was no other issues. In fact, this engine um, I got as part of a package of all the running gear. Um, the running gear came out of a burnt out car um, and the engine had actually been um, damaged in that process and because it was sat in a breaker's yard for a while and water had got into the engine so it was, it was had it really. But, the same guy that sold me all the running gear happens to have a brand new engine, but he said it had come from a dealership, so we weren't quite sure what the history behind that was. It looked fairly new, or it had only done sort of delivery mileage. But when we took the sump off it, we found that the oil spray bar, because they have oil spray under the underside of the pistons, the oil spray bar runs inside uh, by the crank, um, and that was actually in three pieces lying in the sump, so clearly it probably suffered some kind of failure. Maybe it had low oil pressure or something and so it had been rejected quite early in its life and was probably a service exchange thing. So once we fixed all that and built it back up again, um, Roger Smith actually built the engine for me. He had built my Nova racing engines, so uh, you know he knew what he was doing and, and I trusted him to put it together so it was going to be reliable. And it's been totally, uh, totally reliable throughout. <laughs> This thing is wild. It's because the roads are so damp that it just, at the merest hint of throttle, it's wanting to go. But there we go. On a dry bit of road here, that makes quite a difference. There's no. There's no question about getting it fully wound up on a on an English B road. In the beginning, um, when you were starting out, how did you get into Vauxhalls? Was it sort of uh, have you traditionally driven them and been involved with them? Uh, well, my first vehicle really that I used a lot was an Astra van, Mark One Astra van, and as we all know, it's probably the fastest vehicle in the world. Was that petrol or a diesel? It was a 1.6 petrol. No, that's so, rare. How many 1.6s? It was a rocket. And then we had a, a Mark II, which was again a 1.6 with a smaller block engine, uh, and again, phenomenally fast, better aerodynamics, just, uh, yeah, and it got a bit scary when it was rusting away and still capable of 
uh, very high speed. So I'd had, I'd had Vauxhalls um, to run around with at work, and then um, my first race car was an ex-production saloon, um, Nova SR, which had been converted to sport specs over the twin forces and so on. Um, and Roger Smith, who ended up building this engine, helped me tune that car, because the, the carbs were nowhere near set up. Um, and it, it, it didn't run worth a damn, even though it had been raced in that spec. Um, but the principal attraction of that was because it, it had already been raced, it already had a roll cage, um, the engine was already sort of partly tuned. Um, but because it was a sport, and that was a homologation car, we had to run it in um, su uh, super road saloons to start with. Um, the ad advantage of road saloons as a way to get into racing was the fact you could drive to the event, you didn't have to have a trailer and a van and all that kind of stuff. So we used to drive the car to the race, but we soon, obviously, it soon became clear that to set it up for the track, it became unmanageable on the road. Um, but we were in the super road saloons and, and up against highly modified Fiestas and one thing and another, and the 1600 class, because they didn't have a 1300 class. So we, we bought it out, or Roger helped, um, we bought it out to 1400 and all the usual sort of things, tuned it as far as we could, um, and then managed to persuade Vauxhall themselves um, and the organisers of our race, but Vauxhall to include the championship in the dealer bonus scheme which they were running. So um, then it was it got quite serious because um, they wanted to, the only way they wanted to do that was if it was a current sort of production car. By then they had the GTE out, but the GTE was then too new for Super Road Saloons to run it because they wanted older cars which weren't so expensive. So we managed to persuade them to run it. At, a GTE, got Vauxhall on board so that we got bonuses for points that we, we, we won um, and actually came a narrow second in the championship with that car um, and it's sort of final iteration by, by which time it had motorcycle fuel injection on it, um, upgraded brakes from Cavalier, SRIs and all the usual things that Nova people did which was great and everything bolted together, it was all nicely engineered that you could upgrade things very easily. So that's that's what led me into Vauxhalls. And then obviously the daddy at the, soon after then was, was the Lotus Carlton. Um, and after I stopped circuit racing, I moved on to running into the Rover G GTI Championship for another three years after getting rid of Rover. The Rover, yeah. Uh, which, was, which was quite professional and, and for uh, an amateur and, and probably not as gifted a, a driver as some, um, I found that was quite quite a hard time. Um, so stopped racing for a bit, concentrated on the business, but it, then went travelling on holiday in America and um, one of the many truck stops I picked up a magazine leafing through it and there was a tiny little article about this race, um, road race out in the desert. And I'd always been fascinated by the old cannonball runs where, you know, Absolutely. One side of America to the other <laughs> as fast as you can, but clearly that wasn't something that that uh, was was any more possible. But um, this sounded like a sort of legal version of that kind of event, and um, it was called the Silver State Classic. The Silver State Classic, held in Nevada, and the particular individual that this little tiny article was about was a guy called John Hennessy, who went on to be the guy behind the Hennessy Venom and one thing and another. Um, a friend uh, lived in. Texas in Hennessy's hometown of Houston and when I went to see him on holiday I made it a point to go and visit Hennessy's shop and ask him about this race because he'd obviously taken part in it and he wasn't at the shop but his his um, second in command said oh you know I'll give you the organizers details of course this is way before the days of the internet and emails and all this of that kind of stuff. You're in the 90s. Yeah and um, so lots of faxes and phone calls um, established the organising company that this race was actually run out of Las Vegas um, and the road they ran on for the Silver State was Highway 318, about three hours north of Las Vegas. Um, and so we got in touch with them and they said, oh yeah, sure, you know, come out and, and visit. So I went out to visit, um, hired a car, went up to see what was going on. They said, well, you know, you're visiting, but why don't you come and race? So I said, well, how am I going to do that, you know? I said, well, just... It's good for how rent, are you going to go and do rent, that? Aren't rent a car. A lot of people use rental cars. So, so there was a place in... So the next year, my holiday was going out to Las Vegas and going to a, a lovely company called Rent-A-Vet. 
um, where they'd rent you a Corvette and we took it up to the race, and put the stickers on and entered the race. So they were kind of in the knowledge that you were going to do something like that? Of course not, no. no. They had no idea that we were going to do that. I, I mean, I think, I think other people were more brazen. I mean, there was somebody that ran a Viper and actually took their own roll cage, bolted it in and then took it back, put the carpets back over the holes and handed the car back. So but, what's um, the structure of a Silver State Classic then? So the Silver State Classic is run as a, as a regularity rally, effectively. It's a 90 mile road and, and they have speed classes going from 95 miles an hour in five mile an hour increments up to about 160, 165. And then beyond that, it's unlimited. So that's when it's just the fastest car wins. So to work your way up, you have to start by entering one of the slow, slower classes and then uh, enter that class. And the idea is you average as close as possible to the target speed in that class. So if you're in a, we entered in a 105 mile an hour class, you have to average 105. And the winner is not the person that gets the fastest time, it's the closest to that average speed. So you can, in theory, go too fast? So you can go too fast, which is, is what quite a lot of people do. You get carried away in these big, long straights. Well, it wouldn't be, I mean, now you could just go and check it on your phone. You, yes. can, get, you can go and get your geo, uh, GPS tracking, and you know what your average speed is. But it wouldn't be so easy then. You'd have to do some mathematics and calculate. To Absolutely, out. yeah. And so navigation skills are quite key. And, and doing it on my own was clearly not going to be um, possible. I did the Corvette run on, on my own and was sort of 10th or something in class um, with a sort of stopwatch and driving along. Really, it, where am I? What, would, what would that engine be? Did that been then? Like an LS1 V8 type sort of car? Uh, three was, LS1. Was three LS1, yeah. Yeah, and it was a, it was a higher car, so the suspension was shot and it was all wallowy and yeah, it wasn't very pleasant. But it, we, you know, we did it and we got a license and they said, yeah, well, that's all very well, but there's umpteen Corvettes mm -hmm. in this race and we want to see something different. So come back with something British and, you know, we haven't seen it before. <laughs> so I went back and racked my brains and thought, what can we take out there? And I think the choice sort of whittled down to a Bentley Turbo R um, <laughs> or a Lotus Carlton because I wanted something with lots of steel around me. I've always been a big saloon car fan, saloon racing, um, and I didn't fancy a TBR or, or, or you know, a, one of the plastic Lotuses because I just, you know, the idea of going at those sort of speeds and having steel around you as opposed to fiberglass um, appealed. So, and as you know, the Lotus Carlton based on the, the Carlton at the time was very slippery shape. It came off that era when they were searching the lowest possible drag coefficient for economy reasons on the base model cars. These had flush fitting glass. They had all sorts of things which were ahead of their time. Um, and knowing how sort of upgradable Vauxhalls were, and we started with a base model shell and built it to low to spec with the running gear and the crash Carlton. Um, and that took four years um, until we were ready to go back. You're going to go back out to Texas and you're going to race no, Nevada, was it? Nevada's the race, yeah, but I had a friend based in Texas because of the, he was actually a Scot who uh, had settled out there in the oil business. So. so, you've decided that you're going to go back out to the United States and run in the Silver State Classic. And you've decided that the car of choice is going to be a Lotus Carlton. Now, seeing as you're going to strip the whole thing out, it wouldn't have made any sense to go and get a complete, sort of really nice condition Lotus Carlton because this, besides from anything else, it would be really expensive. So how did you approach building the car that we see here? Well, we, we went to Lotus first and asked them uh, for any advice as to what we should be doing to prepare a car for this event. And they actually um, were extraordinarily helpful. Um, and also then um, said that they had actually got a car that had got a half cage in it that had been one of the development cars, one of the late development cars, was still in one piece. But they did admit it was in a bit of a state. It had done salt spray tests and all sorts of other things. So I could imagine, in, you know, a lot of ragging around test tracks and so on. Um, even that, by then, um, I think I decided that I wanted to sort of start with a shell um, <clears throat> without having to gut a, a road car and, and and all that sort of thing. So, uh, and they wanted, you know, money that I hadn't got. So I could just about afford to buy a shell once we found one. There was actually a broker's yard that had a load of new old stock shells and had three or four in there. I wish I'd bought all of them now, but 
Those, um, those were motor shells? They weren't lotus yeah. shells, no. Later on I managed to find a lotus shell, but that's another story. But this was a, a base model shell, so it had the wrong radiator bracket on the front. It, had, it did have a sunroof hole in it. Um, it didn't have any of the wheel arch cutouts uh, or any of the other modifications for a lotus that we needed. So through the contacts um, that I had through racing, I knew a guy that had built a couple of thunder saloons and he was based up in Norfolk and he helped actually to source some of the jigs from friends at Lotus that he could borrow for a weekend and do all the modifications on the shell to allow us to, to install the Lotus running gear, which I got piece by piece through little ads in Triple C and the back of Motoring News and, and Exchange and Mart and all these sort of things that you had to scour in those days to, to find stuff. I guess, as we mentioned, you had the bonnet up, you've got the intakes uh, and the charge covers off a development car. So it was very yeah. slightly different. Yeah. Uh, so your engine, the engine and gearbox, did they kind of come together? Where did they come from? Yeah, the, the gearbox that we had in the, the fire damage car was okay, but then we got offered a brand new gearbox. Um, there were quite a lot of gearboxes floating about at the time, probably still are actually, but they were exchanged under <coughs> exchange, service exchange, because I think owners of these cars in the early years found the gearbox is quite agricultural. They're quite heavy, but also they're very noisy. There's a lot of noises yeah, in the gearbox. Are. We've since figured out ways of actually making them as good as they can be, but they're, they're still quite a big, clunky mm. gearbox. And I think a lot of them had, you know, buzzy gear levers or, or little raffles or whatever, and they were just changed. And so there was low mileage gearboxes floating around, and we happened to find one that was actually brand new. We thought, okay, we'll use that. Similarly with the back axle, there was, um, um, there was a, actually a, a one mate championship uh, called Formula Classic, which <clears throat> Tom Wheatcroft, who used to own Donington Park, established this one mate championship, and he was going to run a series of identical cars, and it, looking like sort of pre-war or post-war Grand Prix cars, single seaters, and going to put lots of stars in them, all going to have the same running gear. And the two prototype cars they built, because he wanted them to have a lot more power than grip, so they had little narrow tyres, and the two prototypes were actually had Lotus Carbon running gear. Um, they soon realised that that was unmanageable. Many of them still So they moved, they moved on to, like a, uh, originally then it was a whole bay engine, and then they ended up with a naturally aspirated Cosworth That'd be insane. Well, a pre war spec car, or what was Carlton engine in it? Yeah, I think the only what person that could car? manage to drive it was the famous Jerry Marshall, who, who <laughs> loved it, but everybody else. Well, it, was, it was dangerous. Um, and a great big heavy lump as well. So, um, but those, <clears throat> those two cars were being broken up, and through contacts in my uh, exhaust business, um, somebody said, Oh, yeah, I know there's some loaded carbon bits. And they had, they had wiring looms, they had uh, back axles, they had um, engines, gearboxes. The engine gearbox was already gone by then, but they still had some wiring, and they had an ECU, which it was the ECU for this car. Um, and they had a Tech One, which is the diagnostics computer, which had the, the Lotus cartridge, which was essential, obviously, for setting one of these up. So that's where I got that from. Um, so a lot of these bits came from lots of different sources and we pulled them all together. Now what made you choose the white paint scheme? I'm going to guess it was just purely down to heat. Um, heat, well, yeah, if you're going to be in the desert then mm -hmm. white tends to reflect the sunlight, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Um, I didn't fancy being in a black car, that's for sure. No. Um, <laughs> and, and also, it makes it easy to work on the car because everything's easy to, to see. If there's any cracks propagating anywhere, you see them quite easily. If there's any oil leaks and things, it's, it's all nice and light and bright. Um, also, you know, I quite like the colour. It's easy to hide scratches and, and white paint's very cheap. That's the other reason. <clears throat> so, you get the car built up and then it's time to get it out to America. How do you get the car to America? Do you just put it in a container? We and actually put ours in a container. Wait. Um, <laughs> There was another uh, another competitor who I didn't even know had entered the race um, from this country in a Lotus Carlton who actually, he put his just on a roll on roll off type of boat that goes over there. If you see shipping cars out, they tend to go on this sort of multi-storey car park on a ship. Um, but the, we had looked into that, which is a lot cheaper to do it like that. But apart from the fact that it's more exposed to the elements, um, there's also the fact that you've got to let some dock hand drive your car onto the ship mm. um, and you can't take any spares or anything. There's no, nothing allowed in the car apart from the car itself. So mm. we wanted to take spare wheels. 
you know, a few tools, jacks, that kind of thing. Um, and this car obviously was clearly sort of more highly modified and I could imagine, you know, would be quite attractive for people ragging around the dockyard. Mm -hmm. um, so we elected to go in, in a container, so the car went, so we took it down to Southampton and it went in a container with all the spares and everything. And then we wove, waved it goodbye and it, it took six weeks or so to get to Galveston. Fortunately, quite local to my friend in Houston, and mm -hmm. um, that's where we took up the. So I guess the when you take it out to the other side, you just drive it. You know, you'd think so, but the first thing we discovered when we took it out the other side is that everything on the car was loose. So all the nuts and bolts, particularly anything with aluminium fittings, like all these air equipped fittings and things like that, the, the mirrors were hanging off because the ambient temperature is so high. You've done everything up nice and tight in the UK and you get to America and suddenly all this stuff is loose. So we had to go oh. through the whole car and make sure every fitting was actually tightened up. Um, and so that was one of the, the key things that we realised. So that was, you know, lots of time spent in car parks doing pre-race preparation, mm. making sure that it wasn't going to um, come apart on us. Now, did, did you go out there, do you have a co-driver with you? Yeah, Dave Byron is the guy that helped me build the car. It was a mechanic I'd known for a long time um, through racing. He actually used to be a mechanic for a, a competitor. Um, uh, but, you know, we got to know each other and I said what we were doing and he helped out a lot of, a lot of time and evenings and weekends and whatever he gave. And when we, and I said I was going out there and he said, well, who's going to co-drive? And I said, well, you built it, you better sit in it. So, um, and I knew that he knew the car back, back to front. And um, if anything needed, you know, doing on the car, either on the event or before the event, and he'd pitch in and help. So, so he sat in bravely uh, as the co-driver. No experience in navigating or anything else, so that was quite entertaining. Um, but um, yeah, we had a we had a uh, you know a good a good time doing it. Yeah. That's the first time you've gone out there. Uh, correct, yeah. 2000 was the first run in September 2000. Um, so we've just seen the Millennium. Um, and uh, yeah, we went out there. The, the car arrived in Galveston. We got out to Galveston, picked it up, and uh, Stuart Donaldson, my friend out in Houston, arranged um, a truck and a trailer to pick it up. Um, I'd, I'd made one stipulation that he got a, a V8 pickup truck. <laughs> and a big he, dual fuel tank thing. Yeah, when he when he met me at the airport, he said, "There's only one problem. I couldn't get a V8." So I thought, "Oh, we're resigned to you know having a V6 or something." He said, "No, I've got a V10." <laughs> so it was a Ford um, F150 with a V10 petrol engine um, with a, a four-wheel trailer on the back of it, and um, crucially hired from Texas. So we didn't get any uh, problems on our road trip up from. Texas to um, Nevada because I was worried that it was just an open pickup truck and we've got all our tools and tires and whatnot in the back and the car just on an open trailer and when I questioned somebody about it in one of the, the motels he said oh don't worry you've got Texas plates nobody's going to bother you right so, <laughs> so we thought okay because most Texans carry guns and they're well renowned for it so obviously <laughs> they didn't know we were just some, some um, innocent Brits but uh, but that was fun that was great fun and so rumbling through the desert you know doing nine miles to the gallon um, how did it go the first time out then so the first time um, obviously it was a bit of a, a sort of trip into the unknown really the first time you do an event like that um, I had a very, very close eye on all the temperatures and the, crucially the first time the diff uh, started overheating quite quickly. Once you're doing sustained high speeds, what Lotus said was absolutely right. Even though we had the cooler on, we, did, we had the diff oil slightly too low so that the cooler wasn't actually picking up oil. It was probably cavitating a bit, picking up a bit of air as well. So it wasn't cooling properly. We also didn't have much ducting over the cooler at the time. So, so it wasn't getting a great deal of air in the boot where it was. Nicely protected from the, from the road and everything, but um, 
So we realised that. We also had some communication difficulties. We didn't. We underestimated totally what the communication was going to be like at 160 plus. Well, as in, can't hear each other. We couldn't hear each other at all. So it was sort of hand signals and, and a lot of shouting and so on. Um, the intercoms we hadn't fitted at that stage. So um, Dave got a bit lost on the, on the notes as well and thought that we were massively ahead on time because obviously you've got to keep to a, and trying to get to the end on an average what speed. What class were you in at that point? So this was a 160 class. So they give you a target speed of getting to 160 average. But also, you're not allowed to drop 30 mile an hour, more than 30 mile an hour below that, uh, and you're not allowed to go more than 20 mile an hour above it, because they safety check the whole car, and if you go above that, they deem that you're disqualified because you haven't actually been safety checked. So they check the tyres crucially, the fire extinguisher system, your roll cage and everything else, but particularly the tyres, because that's they're very, very sensitive about tyre blowouts and that kind of thing. So we should, we've actually shaved the trade off the tyres, to, to keep um, the temperature down um, around Pirelli zero, P0s um, specifically for the event um, and then um, so yeah we were we were concerned about all these things of course every slight noise every slight rise in temperature or anything you're you're worried about so we were keeping the the, the speed of it down and then Dave was suddenly saying no 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 we're going too fast um, so I was as I was losing speed one of the issues I also had in the desert was the wing mirrors um, are actually plastic lenses and it was so hot that they distorted massively so in some kind of weird sort of psychedelic way everything behind me was upside down um, which was slightly and very distorted so it was, it was kind of a yeah um, Hunter S. Thompson kind of psychedelia <laughs> thing that we were getting into a bit of trouble with that so we, it, there's, there's a lot of stress on safety on the event and you let off at two minute intervals but if anybody catches you basically something's gone wrong and that's why they keep you up to a minimum speed we were not going that slowly but clearly were losing time because he'd lost his place in the pace notes um, and at that point a Corvette came past us near the end trailing blue smoke out the back of it um, because I think his diff because they have a transaxle and his diff had massively overheated as well and there was oil all coming out of everything. So then I backed off even more because I was thinking, well, if he's dropping oil, I don't mm. want to be sliding off on his oil. So we came in um, at around about 150 something average, I think it was. And I think out of the eight starters, I think only five cars finished and we finished third. So I didn't think it was a bad, and the fact that we finished at all was, was quite amazing. Um, uh, considering you know the car had never run apart from Brunting Thorpe at anything like those speeds, and then only for a, you know a few seconds. No, there's no way that you the can. There's no way that you can simulate the conditions that you're going to be running into because it's it's basically just you, once you hit the start line, you're getting up to that that very high speed, and you're basically holding it there most of the way. I Absolutely, guess there's a yeah. lot of bends. Yeah, not very many. Uh, no, no. The pace notes were kind of like you know easy left, straight twelve miles, that kind of thing. So. Um, there's a lot of crests uh, and a lot of um, issues with side winds and so on. The first time we ran also in that September there was a headwind. So the car was actually, I wouldn't say struggling, but it had a lot more work to do. I didn't want to push it too hard because of the overheating issues that we were aware of in the back of our mind. As it happened, the engine was the least of our worries. I mean, the diff was the biggest issue. Um, and um, and handling-wise, the car was totally stable. With the nose-down rake that Lotus suggested, um, aerodynamically it was, it was perfectly stable. We put as much weight as we could on the nose of the car so you could see under the bonnet the battery is still in the front. We have got uh, provision for it to go in the boot but we kept all the weight on the nose and in the sort of theory of the paper dart kind of thing that if you put all the weight on the nose it keeps going straight. So all the aero is on the back and the weight's on the nose. So um, it should, you know, it maintains its stability very well at very high speeds. react to the car when they saw it? Did they have the slightest idea of what it was? Was there a lot of curiosity about it? There there was this, yeah, there was. I mean, a lot of people thought, oh, you know, they didn't know what it was. Is that some kind of Nissan or something? I mean, they didn't really understand. The Vauxhall as a brand is completely unknown. 
the idea that, you know, why is it, say, Lotus or Vauxhall here and Lotus on the side and, you know, what, what is it? Um, so they, they, they were a bit unsure, the fact that we're sitting on the wrong side as well, and it just confused the heck out of them, really. Um, the second time we went, uh, I remember at the car show, which they run prior to the actual race, um, all the cars are out on display, and, and I sort of started a conversation with somebody, and I said, oh, yeah, do you know what it is? And this guy just said, well, I don't know what it is, but I saw this run in September, and it was whole and ass. It was his exact words. Um, so he didn't really care, he just knew it was fast. So, uh, yeah, it, it attracted a lot of attention. I mean, there's a saying in America that six in a row doesn't go, because of the, you know, the straight six thing, but I think we'd sort of put that to bed as well. So. Um, yeah, I think they, they were reasonably impressed. And so that was, so you'd done the race, uh, the, the second race, 2000, you know, back in 2001, and the car just stayed in America. So, well, yeah, we did it September 2000, and then um, it stayed with my friend in Houston, um, and we went back over Christmas. My now wife, um, Sam, came with me out for a holiday um, to, to Houston, and I spent the time in the garage tinkering with the car while she went out shopping and enjoying sort of the Christmas festivities. Um, so we did a few upgrades, notably the diff cooler. Um, we, we changed a few things on that, put an electric fan on, improved the ducting um, to the back. Um, we're hopeful that was going to do it. Changed the oil, there actually wasn't a lot of oil left in the diff when I drained it out. It was actually a, a horrid colour and, and not very much left. So it obviously had got very hot. So we just, fingers crossed, it was going to be okay for a second run. But everything seemed to be okay, serviced the car, um, all ready to go for, for May 2001, uh, which is effectively the same race, although they call it the Nevada Open Road Challenge or something like that. So, um, same, uh, same road, 90 miles, uh, same start and finish, um, and same organisers. So, they knew we were coming this time, and actually, um, as, as Ed just reminded me, the, uh, the first time we went, when we turned up, they issue all the, the starters with their race numbers and usually these are pre-printed out so as you sign in to the event they give you, oh you've got your race numbers and we turned up having exchanged all these faxes and long distance phone calls and whatever saying yeah we're coming from Britain with the car, yeah yeah sure you are and then when we turned up to sign on they were rootling about trying to find our numbers, oh uh, we don't seem to have printed them out, we've only got blank ones because I, I think they didn't think we were going to turn up so um, anyway, we got our, our race number, which was, um, I asked for number 49, but we had to have something starting with a one, so it had to be above 100, so we had 149, which was where the, on our um, Instagram page is Agamemnon 149, so the race number was 149. Um, and um, so we had to get the Sharpies out and write in our own numbers on the, on the um, uh, on the race numbers. The second time we went, they got our race numbers ready that time, so they knew we were coming. So the next time out, no, no issues with pace notes or diffs or anything like that. This was no, flat, I don't make sure. I, well, even though we'd got the intercom on, I took the pace notes with a pinch of salt whenever Dave said it was left and it was actually right, so I, I kind of had a bit more of a clue. We'd been through some video and, and you know, um, had a bit more of a clue where the road was going and, and made sure that we. Uh, stay on it and um, and I sort of made a, a plan that if we got to about half distance and all the temperatures were right, the car seemed reliable, we were just going to go for the fastest time we could um, because they told us prior to the event, we knew we weren't going to win the average speed thing because we just weren't sophisticated enough on all the navigation stuff, people had computers and all that kind of thing. Um, you got sort of, you know, Air Force navigators doing this sort of stuff and they, they get to within 0.001 of a mile an hour of the average speed well I didn't think me and Dave were going to do that so we just thought well, we'll go as fast as we can within the speed parameters. Um, the wind was behind us the second time in May and um, we'd also been told that to qualify for unlimited you had to have done at least one run of 165 average. So I thought well let's if we get half distance and the car's still in one piece and we're just going to go for it. So that's, that's what we did. There's one section um, where they told us beforehand there's a speed uh, camera, well, a speed radar trap, um, and that's where they enforce the maximum speed you're allowed. So we knew we couldn't get to over 180. So, but they tell you where it is, and this, we just put it on the face notes, saying, okay, at that point, we need to be no more than 180. 
And on the speedo, I was at 180, on, on the, dead on the speedo, through that mile, um, where I knew that the radar trap was. And their radar was 177, so I think that's yeah, Perfect. pretty good going. And then, uh, beyond that, it did go over 180. I don't know what the real speed was. I mean, it's geared. You have to do it all in fifth gear, sixth gear is, is hopeless. It's way, you yeah, won't pull it. Well, I'm doing Six gears got a theoretical top speed of over 300 miles an hour. I think oh, it's crazy. Silly, silly, yeah. <laughs> so aerodynamically, you just hit a brick wall, really, um, and the revs run out. Um, so I think you know it was sort of a, a really. I don't know on this ECU actually what the rev limit set at because again, I so it's a development ECU, so it's potentially perhaps a bit higher. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think we can safely claim that we were probably pushing 180. And a couple of times on the, these kind of dips, the car skipped, and you could hear the, the revs flare slightly as the back wheels are coming off the ground. So you know that you know a few degrees up or down, and you're going to start getting airborne. So it's um, so yeah, it gets your attention. Second time, that was a big success. Then that was achieved. Didn't you say? Yeah, it was. Time. We didn't quite get 165, but 163 we were told was close enough. So definitely. Um, yeah, and uh, we were second in class. And again, you know, lucky to finish. A lot of cars don't finish. Some one guy said, you know, he'd be going five years and not finished a race with issues. So the fact that we'd come sort of from the UK and in a you know unknown car to them and, and managed to finish both times, I think was quite a good achievement. Probably. And great fun. Oh yeah, sounds like great fun. <laughs> oh, I'm going to rent a Corvette now. I'm going to have a shot myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cars come back home. What have you been doing with it over the years? Have you? Because interestingly, you've just got it back on the road in the last sort of week or so, which has kind of been one of the things which has uh, motivated this to happen for us to come down and video it and get the story of it together. Yeah. Um, but I think it's fully road legal. It is you, still fully road legal. Yeah. We've. Um, it is the first time it's been on the road, uh, or had an MOT, I think, for about three years. Um, Prior to that, since 2001 when it came back, we did a few shows and as you know, did some stuff with Total Vauxhall and um, used to go to the, the VBOA meeting once a year and that kind of thing when, when, we, when we could. Um, business has taken over a bit. Um, I brought up a family, my son's here. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it has to take a bit of a backseat to, to life in general. But and so it's fallen into maybe, um, slightly um, neglected state, not disrepair or anything. I mean, I've always kept it dry and stored it carefully, but um, but yeah, I haven't really been running it so much. I think the best events we did, we did a few track days and things in it, and it's quite different. I mean, it was obviously designed for a purpose, for high speeds, and the gearing is probably all wrong for most of the UK circuits. The only event that really came into its own is we used to go to RAF Marham and use the long straight there as part of a, a track day um, which was great fun out in Norfolk and back into its sort of home county really to, so to speak um, and um, and there yeah you could leave all the caterums and and um, hot hatches behind on a long straight. But it just it literally start, it starts wanting to do its serious work over 80 miles an hour yes. and that's when it starts to everything starts to come together for it and of course so much in the UK you're going up to 80 miles an hour now kind of coming there's yeah. not much there's not much where you, you can do where you can really give it the full full whack and really stretch its legs. Yeah, absolutely. So would you consider that would you consider ever going back again out to the states to go and have another crack at it? I think we've um, I had considered the twenty year thing, um, and but unfortunately, what with you know COVID. COVID and everything else, I mean, almost immediately after we'd finished, actually, nine eleven happened, and that sort of made transatlantic travel itself, you know, a lot more expensive and time consuming and, and difficult. Um, but since then, you know, a lot's happened. Uh, and since the COVID thing, obviously that's not, I mean, I wouldn't blame that entirely. But, um, but yeah, I sort of thought, well, maybe we should go out in 20 years and, and see them. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But 25 years is not far away now. So I think 2025, well, thereabouts, we, we perhaps ought to plan something, whether we take this car or take another car. Or, yeah, we take this. But um, <laughs> I, think, I think, as you say, you know, if, if cars have a personality, this one 
certainly um, yeah likes the heat and the speed so absolutely I think that's got to happen like all things being well yeah I hope you do make it back out there and you're able to take this yeah I think it would be a nice thing to do yeah it's a fantastic story See it. It's been great. Yeah, you're most welcome. Thank you for coming. No problem. And I hope to, yeah, hopefully we'll see it again out uh, and about uh, next summer in 2022 at some events as well. Well, yeah, we hope to do some shows find, and things. Yeah. Find some good stuff to go and do. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Cool. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. This is how nosy Bob is. Now you look, see Bob, all I've got to do now is that. And now I've caught a bobcat. She hasn't even noticed yet. Bob! <sighs> you do realise they're now shutting the cat box. Hey Bob! How long is it going to take for you to notice? Well, you were hard to trap, weren't you? Boo!